Welcome to another Great War special episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer your questions about the First World War. Juan Gerber writes, Who set the barbed wire in no man's land and how? Please, I need to know. Okay, um, well, I'll help you out there. Um, men, obviously, laid the wire in no man's land. Now, being part of a wiring party, being sent out as a wiring party, was pretty much the least popular job a soldier could be given. Because you'd have to go out there with these steel pickets up to six feet long and rolls and rolls and rolls of barbed wire. Now the pickets were knocked into place with mallets that had, you'd muffle the mallets so you couldn't hear the sound. And the wire was fastened top and bottom to the pickets and then rolled out into what were called aprons. This was mostly done at night and was incredibly dangerous. You'd have to be as quiet as you could and you'd often have to dive for cover from enemy fire. And you had to go pretty far from your trench to do this. See, the wire emplacements were ideally far enough away from the trench that the enemy couldn't get close enough to lob a grenade into your trench. So that's pretty far. And they really were virtually impassable. When you set them up though, you might leave gaps that were the only way through so you had those gaps covered with machine guns so you could slaughter all of the enemy when they came funneling through the gap. Now, if you were the one attacking and had to get through, you first tried shelling the wire with artillery, but this was often ineffective, so you had to send men in advance with wire cutters. How much fun does that sound? The British actually developed a wire cutter, uh, a wire cutter blade that you could fit to the muzzle of your rifle. And you could also use what was called a Bangalore torpedo, which sounds kind of dirty, but, well, it was actually a long pipe filled with explosives that would detonate under the wire. Now, wire was dangerous in other ways too. It was dirty and it was rusty, and just cutting yourself could lead to a lingering death from infection. Uh, how much wire was used, you may be asking yourself, or asking me. There are actually estimates that by 1918, over a million miles of barbed wire had been strung up in just Flanders fields alone. That's nearly twice to the moon and back on one theater of battle. George Stevens writes, here's a question. I see a lot of soft hats on heads in the period footage. I understand the German helmets weren't helmets, but leather. When did the sides learn that cloth doesn't stop bullets or shrapnel or much of anything? <laughs> Good question. Uh, it was the French who began to use a steel skull cap under their soft caps, uh, the kepis. And these steel skull caps were issued from March 1915. And they were soon replaced by the Adrian M 1915 steel helmets. And by the end of 1915, over three million of those helmets had been produced. They were based on the French firemen's helmets of the time. And they were adopted by the Belgians, the Russians, the Serbians, and the Italians. And the Central Powers, of course, followed suit soon after the French seeing their effectiveness in stopping something. Hugo E. Ruano writes, How badly did the systematic movement of people out of Warsaw affect the Russian or the Austro-German Austro war machine? Well, it especially affected the Russian one. Um, the evacuation of Warsaw meant that you had hundreds of thousands of people, including hundreds of thousands of children and old people, clogging the roads. And the roads, as you went further east, were poorer and poorer in quality and fewer and far between, anyhow. And imagine trying to maneuver your army, which was already on the defensive, through roads clogged with hundreds of thousands of terrified, slow-moving refugees. It was a logistical nightmare for the Russians. It was one of many logistical nightmares for the Russians. Um, XX, XX Zonus XX, or Kiss Kiss Zonus Kiss Kiss? whichever one, uh, writes, for out, outside the trenches, what is happening in Luxembourg during the war? Transport. Transportation is happening. Luxembourg was the first country overrun in the war. The night before Germany invaded Belgium, they invaded Luxembourg to take the telegraph and railway lines. If you think that Luxembourg had any means of preventing this, then you are very much wrong. And that was it for Luxembourg. It was occupied from the first day of the war to the last. Actually, German Chancellor Bethmann Holweg, uh, he justified the invasion by saying, well, the French were going to invade also. You know. He even said Germany would reimburse Luxembourg for the inconvenience. However, in 1915, when it looked like Germany might win the war, the Chancellor changed his plans, and he said that it was going to now become a German federal state once victory had been achieved. 
Uh, actually, you can check out that episode from the beginning of the war right here. And you can check out our Facebook page where our social guy Flo puts up all kinds of really cool stuff. Don't forget to subscribe. See you Thursday.